Thank you, Rabbi Steve, and thank you for what a blessing that you are to our city. You are a father in the faith, and the things that you do with evangelism and outreach and feeding and winning souls and celebrating the feasts and, and bringing Yeshua to us, we honor you and your congregation, and we are so grateful for your yes to the Lord. Well, you all that have been watching Come Home for any amount of time know my deep, deep love for the Torah and my conviction about everything that Yahweh says to us regarding Israel. And there's so much that we have yet to learn. And it is just this beautiful landscape ahead of us. And I don't want to wait until I get my glorified body to learn this. I want to start learning and practicing right here. And that's why I invite you to go on the journey with me. Today we have an incredible guest, a brilliant woman who has a, a, a testimony that spans different countries and different faiths uh, in, in her search, in her quest uh, to find out who God truly was. And then from that, uh, she has written and explored, she mentors, she teaches, she has courses, and I'm just so honored to have Dr. Dina die. Thank you so much oh, for being here. Oh, thank you. You're so sweet to have me. It's great to be in Florida, let me tell you. Yeah, all the way from New Mexico. <laughs> yeah, I love the 75 degree weather. Well, we, we like it too. Yes. <laughs> we do not complain. And... Every once in a while, we want snow and boots and sweaters, but not for very long. Okay, well, you can come visit us. We yeah. will. You'll get your fill. <laughs> well, you got Arctic blood because you were born in Canada, right? Well, I was actually born in the United States. Oh, you were? Okay. San Francisco, but I grew up in Canada. Okay. So, yes, I do have some Arctic blood. All right. And so, so, Dr. Dina, tell us a little bit about your childhood, your testimony, because I think that's so important as we will later transition to your assignment, your yes. assignment from God yes. to bring the temple to us and break it down in bite-sized pieces. Exactly. Yeah, so I, you know, raised in a conservative Jewish home in Ottawa, Canada. I went to an Orthodox Jewish summer camp and I went to a Hebrew school. So I had, we had the basics and we celebrated the festivals. Yeah. My favorite being, of course, Passover. Yes. And when you're nine years old and you're yeah. drinking your father, your grandfather's wine and you have four <laughs> glasses of wine, you know, that's kind of memorable. Right. right? You know. <laughs> Love Passover. But, you know, that was that was our environment. We did go to synagogue, not regularly. Um, conservatives aren't, aren't quite like the Orthodox. Yes. But that was in my blood. That was who I was. But then the struggle came in the teen years, right? We right. all know that. And then I ended off, you know, becoming a hippie, essentially. This is the 70s, <laughs> yes. right? And in search of myself, who am I? Why am I here? You know, I call myself the wandering Jew, like so many <laughs> others, because <laughs> I traveled all around. But I had formed for myself three things that I felt if I found the truth, it would fit. And, and basically, it would be something for everyone. It would, um, it would be based on love and would be easy to understand. So that was my criteria okay. as I went through my endless journey. And I spent five years living out of a 15-pound backpack and wow. traveled all over Europe, the Middle East, North Africa. Then I went down to Central and South America, all over the place, really just still in search. So I, I had a lot of interesting experiences through all of that. But I did spend some time in Israel in 1974, right after the Yom Kippur War. I was there for about six months. So that was very, very interesting, a very sobering time yeah. as well. And, uh, you know, I, I ended up, the 70s were a very volatile time in Europe. I don't know if people remember, but there were a lot of, you know, wars and rumors of wars. And I somehow managed to get involved in another, I was, I was in a military coup in, in uh, Greece, and then it, there was a war that broke out between Greece and Turkey. I was living on the island of Crete. Believe it or not, I was living in a cave at that time. Wow. I worked in a ski resort in Switzerland, did that. I, when I was in Spain, there was a, a, a coup of some type with Franco. Uh, the very first day that I arrived in Europe, Believe it or not, I, I came out of the Victoria tube station and it blew up. So I was like, welcome to Europe. So there's just all these different things that happened while I was there in my search. But the funniest one, I think, I we had to get out of Greece and we were taking a boat to, to Barcelona. I met a guy on the boat who was a Trekkie, right? <laughs> He had a solid gold enterprise around his neck. Wow. I always remember that. But we sat on the deck of the boat just sort of talking about uh, trying to find truth. 
And so that was, you know, that was my heartbeat. That was what motivated me. And it, it, it did take some years after that, but that's what I was in search of. So the Trekkie contributed to your eventual born again experience. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's the first time I've heard that. Isn't that bizarre? <laughs> there was a lot of bizarre. You know, I go into a bookstore in London, for example, and just kind of pull out all the sort of new age mystical stuff. I felt like that's where I needed to go yeah. to, to find the truth. So, I mean, you know, I can't share the whole story, but ultimately um, I ended up going to a, um, a, a guy who read, you know, the crystal healing deal uh -huh. thing. Yeah. Uh, this was when I was in New Mexico. I was in Taos. I went to some place called the Quinby Center. So they put the crystals over you and telling you who you were in your last life and trying to, you know, soften your chakras, that kind of strange stuff. But he told me in my last life that I was a disciple of Christ in Israel. Oh, wow. Yeah, was like, that was God's joke on me. <laughs> so you so, began to research yes. the disciples. <laughs> so I went back to Taos. I took all the books out of the library and started reading everything. And believe it or not, I read the Bible cover to cover in a week. Yeah, who does You're that? Brilliant. Well, That's brilliant. that was fast. When I got to the story of the woman caught in the act of adultery, mm -hmm. that was my moment. It was like, Aww. Yeshua is the Messiah because he fulfilled those three things. And that was just, every, everything changed at that point. And another sort of little short story just to go along with that, um, I, you probably don't remember, but back in the day, the, Richard Alpert, who became Ram Dass and Timothy Leary and Harvard and, you know, their tune in, turn out, all that sort of stuff. He was with an organization and they decided to have a statue commissioned of the monkey god Hanuman. <laughs> so it was from Ceylon, which is now Sri Lanka. And so they brought it over to New Mexico and they were going to unveil it at this event in Taos, which is where we lived. And so they bring it in and there's this wooden box with these slats and they start pulling off the slats of the box. There's, I don't know, maybe about 100 people there. Everybody is standing with bated breath waiting for the statue to come out of the uh, box. The monkey god. The monkey god. Oh, goodness. So out it comes. It's all marble, wearing an orange outfit, and it's got like a gold scepter. Okay. I mean, it's the gaudiest thing you've ever seen in your life. <laughs> but at that moment, every single person there bowed down to that statue. I mean, my friend and Jane and I, who had met in Guatemala, we were absolutely horrified. Even though I wasn't a believer yet, the horror, you know, I was horrified. Yeah. We looked at one another and we, and I heard, I heard God say in an audible voice in my head, thou shalt have no other gods before me. And I've always attributed, that's my moment. I feel that if I had stepped over and bowed down, that I wouldn't be here today. The that I would have just sucked you it in. It would have sucked me in and I, who knows where I would have ended up. Wow. So at that moment, you know, we chose to stand. Yeah. Everyone else is bowing. And I feel that I still have a bit of that hippie rebellion in me. <laughs> well, God can use any character attribute as long as we're surrendered. Amen, and sister. Yeah. We can we can be a hellraiser in the world, and then when we get born again, we can be a hellraiser against the kingdom of hell. That's exactly right. Yeah. Well, you had the fear. You know, you had the fear of God in you. Something yes. from Torah school. Yep. Something from synagogue. Something yep. from the feast had been planted in your heart, in your little girl heart, and you remembered yes. that first commandment. Yeah. And, you know, I think that that's what so many people need, need to hear, Dr. Dina, is that our job is to train up a child in the way he should go. Our job is to pray for our seed and our, our grandchildren and the future generations. But it's the Holy Spirit's job Amen. to remind. Yes. And so in that moment, that's where it counted for you. Absolutely. And that was a long time ago. So I became a believer in 1979. Wow. This is a long time ago. <laughs> but, you know, from that moment on, I never looked back. And really, I always had a heart for history. When I was in school, I just loved history, ancient history in particular, studying the Babylonians and the Persians and all that. So I just dove right into it from 1979 and laid a, a, a long foundation for myself to be able to study and research to get to this place over 40 years now that I've been doing it. So the books are sort of the fruit of all of those years of, you know, navigating through the journey and trying to figure out, you know, what is God doing? What is he saying? Well, yeah, and what is the message for today? Even though the, the, the context of the Bible is the ancient world, it, it can be, you know, we make an application for today. What does it mean for us now? Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, I know I have viewers watching that are history buffs and they love Bible history. And, and, and even your book has a scientific uh, element to it because you're talking about the cosmos and you're talking yes. about creation. And, and then there's this artistry because you bring the temple in. And, yes. Uh, I, I love the symbolism. And I, I appreciate that, you know, as you said, this has been your life's work. So you got your PhD. Uh, it's a D-man, okay. Doctor of Ministry, yeah, Hebraic Studies and Christianity. Wow. And so that, that gave you even more fuel. Um, and when I first read the New Testament, if you remember, I had never read it. Right. I knew nothing. Yeah. So even reading it for the first time, I could see the Hebrew flavor in it. Yeah. And I could pull out those things. And so my goal is to be able to help folks connect the New Testament to the, to the, the Tanakh or the Old Testament. You know, I always say if if um, Jews could read the New Testament, they would just absolutely be thrilled, thrilled at it is it is a fulfillment. It's re it's manifestation. It's revelation. It is just it's supernatural. It's and it's all there. You know, the Book of John, for example, is just filled with festival imagery. It, it I is. mean, you got Yeshua going to festival here, there, and everywhere. And the language in it, it's just, it's magnificent. And so, I mean, I would encourage Jews, read it. Yeah. And it'll just elevate the soul. That's right. Yeah, and you know, as Jews uh, read it, they can pray what King David prayed. He said, you know, open my eyes that I may behold wonders from your word. That's mm -hmm. not New Testament, that's Old Testament. And anything in the Old Testament, pray it. And there's, uh, there's so many that Yeshua is visiting Amen. In special ways, because he, he will go to whatever length necessary, whatever That's extent, right. to, to win those um, into the kingdom. He wishes that none should perish. So I think your books are masterpieces because from the description, the covers, there's no clue really that you're gonna turn toward Yeshua. You, you're dealing with things right. about the temple. Right. And of course, from the Hebraic mindset, they love the temple yes. and, they're, and they wanna rebuild the temple. So, so how did the Holy Spirit start um, saying, okay, Dina, this is your lane. This, this is where I want you. I want you to camp out here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pour some really awesome stuff into you. Well, it took a long time and I didn't recognize even though there's so many chapters that are dealing with the temple in you know different different ways, I didn't see the thread from the very beginning. I didn't see it in Genesis chapter one, and I read a book by John Walton, and it kind of I just went, oh my goodness, this has been there all along. Even though I had studied a lot, and you know, looking at Solomon's temple and the tabernacle, etc., I I didn't see it running all the way through. So it's about 15 years ago. It, uh, you know, I just, well, one day it was kind of like, oh my goodness, it's all there. And so then I really started to research. And when I understood that Genesis chapter one was a temple pattern, that was a game changer. Yeah. So you know, we we can look at it scientifically. I, I'm choosing not to in talking about it to say that the the creation story or creation is te is technically synonymous with temple building because God is building a universe for the place of his presence, which is the purpose of a temple, so that his presence will be there and his image bearers will draw near. And then there's a whole protocol that goes with that to ascend into the presence of God. So all, you know, the, 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 the tabernacle just is, the, is like a miniature of the cosmos. That's how they saw it in the ancient world. Yeah. And so then Solomon's temple is kind of a miniature of the tabernacle or connected to the tabernacle and a pattern and a model of the universe. So then when we get into the New Testament, Yeshua talks about his body as being a temple and Paul is speaking about us as being a temple. Now I, I want people to see it as a big picture. This is a cosmic pattern, our, our bodies and not just us individually, but our the whole communal, uh, the covenant communal people because we do tend as Americans to focus in on us individually, right. but it's really talking about the whole community. Looks like the cosmos, like who can even wrap your mind around that, but so that God will once again place his presence in the midst of his people. 
And my goal is for to help people see it's Jew and non-Jew coming together. Yeah. I don't want us to be in boxes and say, you know, we're not, we're not working together. The Lord may have given the pattern and the model to the Jewish people, but they are to extend that out. And so that all will come in and all will serve as this place where God's presence can dwell and basically return us back to the garden for all of humanity, all of his image bearers. Right. Well, that was mouthful, yeah. that was, but it was powerful. I, I appreciate you using the term image bearers because I think that's so important that we, we understand that, that we're made in his image Amen. in his likeness. And that really can give us the motivation that we need, you know, for a holiness lifestyle. Absolutely. Well, we are his workers on yeah. earth. It's the same way in the garden. We see that, that Adam, Adam in the garden was to work and serve the garden. There's a term for, for work and, and for serving. And he is, you know, he placed Adam, he rested Adam in the garden and, and that's our place to work. We're, that's our vocation. Right. And we are image bearers in that vocation where we're supposed to work with him, Yahweh. It, you know, he's not making us do it all by ourselves and we are not making him do it all by himself. I think some people, unfortunately, think God's gonna wave a magic wand yeah. and everything's gonna be okay. But he has decided to work with us and let us be his hands and feet extended across the whole earth, planting seed to turn the whole earth once again into a temple. We have to, we partner with him. We're his ambassadors. We rule and reign with Amen. him. He's done everything that he's going to do, but he needs us. And I, and I think you're absolutely right, Dr. Dina, that sometimes in our Western mentality, our American mindset, we don't see the big picture. Right. And there's other countries that really understand that whole global um, revelation of one new man more than we do. Yeah. But we're going to catch up. We are, absolutely. Because, because of workbooks like this, because of, you know, you've done a book, a temp, The Temple Revealed in Creation. Right. The Temple Revealed in the Garden. In the Garden. And now The Temple Revealed in Noah's Ark. Yes. In fact, let's go and just see this little clip about the books. Sure. And, and about this one in particular, just so that, so that the viewers can get a little idea. Sounds good. you in my class. Well, and I want to talk about that because if, if, if any of you watching are interested, you can go to foundationsintorah.com mm -hmm. and that is where all Dr. Dina Dye's materials are. So in addition to the trilogy, you have a workbook, which is the, which combines all three. Correct. Yes. And so then, whatever themes, I look for a, a similar theme in each of the books right? and then I've turned it into a chapter. So, for example, we have one, uh, the Cosmic Mountain, um, Eden, the sacred space or the, or the sacred center, the waters of chaos, uh, all, uh, creation, uh, creational order, and let's see, creation covenant. Wow. So all of those I talk about in each of the books, and so then I put it all together. So when we, it, it can be a six-week uh, course or 12-week, I, I give people an option. And uh, it's 12 chapters, so basically it's a chapter a week. And then I, you know, we go through it and I discuss, explain, and we ask lots of questions because the one thing that Americans and Western thinkers don't seem to do is ask enough questions. Well, and I, I, you, I heard you say that, and I appreciate that, that, you know, a true Jew, when a question's asked, they answer the question with a question. And that Jesus is me. <laughs> <laughs> ask my husband, that is me. Okay, well, it, it's a little bit of woman. Too, you know, a lot Jew, a little bit woman, but it's so important. Jesus is not intimidated. Yeshua is not intimidated by our questions. He welcomes them. He wants us to ask. Well, I don't know how you learn anything if you don't ask a question. Right. 
And in the Western model, the old wineskin church, I believe to be old wineskin, is just a lecturer that's speaking. Right. And there's no interaction. And in the midst of the shutdown, I think one of the greatest gifts is that we went on Zoom, we went into these little smaller communities where we were able yes. to take courses and ask questions. Agreed, yeah. And I love that you facilitate that, that you do it yourself. Yeah, no, it's great. And, and people love it. Uh, they come on and we, you know, I'm trying to give them enough uh, tools to equip them to be able to do their own studies. Yes. My goal is the big picture. Yeah. And then you can fill in with all the things that you've learned. I appreciate also, Dr. Dina, just the order because things are, our world is such in a chaotic yeah. place. And I know, you know, to some degree, every generation feels that way, but I, I think most would agree. It just seems more chaotic than, Absolutely. than normal. Yeah. But God has an order, but we can't ask God to come to, to our terms. We have to go up and we have to go higher to his terms of order and understand the patterns that started long, long ago. And you break that down in bite-sized, understandable, palatable pieces. I hope so, yes. <laughs> you do. Yeah. So that that's a very important and dominant theme in, in the scriptures, is this uh, battle between chaos and order. And I, some would call it uh, the kingdoms of this world or empire, uh, you know, the kingdom of our Lord and Messiah, that sort of thing. But that's the clash. Yeah. And, and people don't like to think of it in political terms, but unfortunately the Bible is very political yeah. because we see the backdrop for Israel always from, from Abraham on is some sort of empire. Yeah. Everyone's got to deal with it. So that is, I think is a great message for us today is how do we live under empire? Yeah. How do we resist empire? How do we subvert empire? And how do we overcome? Yes. And that's the, the focus of the books to help us to understand how to do that. Well, I would love it if you would just pray for someone watching right now. Just be led um, by the Lord. Amen. Lord, we just, uh, we just lift this ministry before you. Not my ministry, but your ministry. And Lord, we know that people are just struggling with the chaos around them and trying to make sense of things, things that don't make sense. And we're trying to... We want your order. We cry out for your order. We, mm. we cry out for that, that place of peace and shalom. And so for those, Lord, who are really struggling, we pray that they would turn mm. back to you. They would approach you, Lord. They would allow your presence and your spirit to come upon them and to transform them and to change them into your image, to become your image mm. bearer. Amen. Amen. Dr. Dina, thank you for My just pleasure. dedicating your life to this, for studying to show yourself approved, and then for inviting us and the communities you've blessed with you on the journey. So I encourage you today, go to foundationsandtorah.com. This is one of the books, there's many. It'll bless you, it will help you grow, 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 learn, 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 and be filled with the Spirit. My name's Jen Mallon, and I encourage you, come home. <laughs>